Thank you very much, Geneva, um, for this great overview and um, letting us uh, diving a bit deeper into this situation. And now we will move in a discussion here. Um, and I want to introduce the first uh, panelist um, here around uh, the circle. It's Mamadou Goita. Um, Mamadou, very welcome. Um, you are the director of IRPAD. IRPAD is the Institut de Recherche et de Promotion de Al de Alternative de et Développement in Mali. Um, you at the same time, um, you were co-founder of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa some months ago. Um, and uh, um, so when I put a first question to you is um, seeing those challenges, seeing those challenges at the ground for you in the field of food sovereignty and the right to food. But, um, what are at the moment the stones you have already thrown into the water to bridge the challenges, to overcome the challenges? And, um, and what do you think could be the support of the international community in making this strategy, a uh, safer strategy. Uh, thank you very much. I will be uh, very brief to allow for uh, more interaction in the, on this discussion. And I hope that you will understand my English because uh, my country was colonized by France. So I have the uh, historical uh, obligation to speak in French. But since uh, uh, I don't have any chance here, I will speak in English. And I hope you understand what I'm saying. Uh, this point is very important because uh, there, is, there are many, many fights that are scattered all over the world. Uh, there is a need to bring our fight together. Uh, on these issues, I will talk about two different things. The first stones are about uh, networking alliances and all these uh, uh, kind of uh, strategies that we are trying to develop mainly in West Africa, but also in Africa globally, and uh, enlarging it to the world. And the second part is some political positions on some of the issues that have been taken by uh, organization. It didn't mention Europa, because I'm representing also Europa here as a. One second, can, can someone switch off that? It's very distracting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in West Africa, in the case of West Africa, uh, there have been a strong commitment of uh, mainly farmers' organizations, uh, members of ROPA, uh, including all the West African countries with national platform, on two main issues. The first one is all the positions that have been taken on these key issues related to production in terms of agriculture, enlarging it to different sectors, because we don't separate uh, vegetable growing from uh, pastoralism and, and, and cattle, but also on fishing, because you know that farmers' organizations involve also these uh, different uh, 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 players. And trying to build a regional network that has contributed a lot to change the trend of a, a total common policy in West Africa. You know today that there are some key concepts that have been included, and we are now implementing this concept at regional level in West Africa. The first one is full sovereignty. For the first time in the world, the concept of full sovereignty that was, for the first time, uh, 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 just uh, uh, included in the debate by uh, Via Campesina uh, in, a, in a FAO 19, 1996 meeting, has been included in a regional policy. Because farmers' organizations think that the issue of food, the issue of agriculture in a broad sense cannot be only a technical issue, it's a political one. And we need to bring together the key things related to the downstream and, and, and upstream of production, including energy issue, including the reality that is climate change, but also bringing together all the movement to show that when we accept that there is a political, a deep political side on food and agriculture, though we need to have a concept. So this concept is today part of ECOWAP. ECOWAP is a regional policy, agricultural policy in West Africa. The second key concept that we, 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 we happen to include in this policy is saying that family farm system, this is a mode of production, it's not 
because uh, we're talking about traditional way of doing things and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a model production that family farms is a key pillar of production in West Africa. So linking this, Europa has been working politically on these issues, bringing the, the concept together. We need to open the debate. And now we have policy papers on seven key issues related to even climate change on seed in terms of research, but also uh, uh, food reserves and how family farms can be the pillar of production in the region as a model production instead of a, an entity that has to be separate from the issue of investment. The second thing is that we, as a stone, institutionally, behind, beyond this, these uh, regional uh, uh, issues, uh, uh, we have a network that is called Copagen. And Copagen has contributed. We have a network. We have uh, uh, different networks in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, like EBN, like uh, uh, um, uh, Friends of the Earth in uh, the African side. So we set up an alliance that is called Alliance for Full Sovereignty in Africa. Just to really relate these issues, saying that it's bringing our effort, our strategies, and our beliefs our uh, 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 diversity altogether that we can happen to change the trend. Because corporate side is very strong, bringing resources, hijacking processes at the UN level, but also at different, uh, uh, different parts where the debates are taking place. How can we uh, just try to change the trend of this issue, uh, of this uh, uh, political debate, have an impact also on all the investment issues in agriculture? Because Investment in agriculture is one of the key things that we need to, to take care of because it's bringing not only resources where they shouldn't be. If we have a mapping today, you look at GAFs, you look at uh, Agra in Africa, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, and so on and so forth, you will see that it's a corporate-led investment system that is uh, taking place. So how can we move? So AFSA is working on that. But we have also some bilateral, the India, Africa, Millet project, for instance. So this is an initiative that we are trying to push forward. This is bringing all together production issues, climate change issue, but also all the discussion about market. What kind of market are we talking about? Because the key thing is about also the market issue. And the last one that I want to mention is all the work that we are trying to push forward on say on on concept like. Uh, uh, a climate smart agriculture issue. We, there is a lot of misunderstanding on this concept. So we need to invest our energy. So we're working also within farmers' organizations, but also NGOs, world, and all the social movement, just to, to see how can we relate this issue to what is happening today. When you talk about adaptation in climate change, there have been a lot of things that have been done. How can we push them forward instead of putting resources on technologies that are not under control and that can be very harmful for the world. Thank you very much for Banam, and I hope that the next debate will allow to deepen some of these points. Thank you. Yes, so next speaker would be Hajid. Um, Hajid, thank you very much for, um, on short notice, jumping in here. Um, replacing your own boss. Um, and, uh, it's Joanna Kerr who was supposed to be here. She had to cancel yesterday because of health reasons. Um, and so you, um, I'm very happy that you jumped in. Action Aid focuses also on the issue of um, addressing the root causes of hunger, um, calling for international food policies and um, supporting small farmers. Um, at, uh, you yourself, you have been very active also in disaster relief work um, in India after the tsunami, tsunami in uh, different parts uh, of the world, also after earthquakes. Um, so a lot of experience on the ground in this field also. And now focusing the last years very much on adaptation in the climate change, both on the grassroots level and on the negotiation level in UNFCCC. Um, so if you think also on the point saying, yes, there are two or three things which we have to move now forward for really making progress, seeing that things become more and more urgent, um, seeing that the dynamics are to a good part going in the wrong direction, what would you think are those stones we should place in the river on the way to the transformation necessary? Okay. 
Thanks, Christoph, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I think this is, this is quite timely. We are talking about transformation, and I'm really happy uh, with the introductory speeches. I think we are totally on board in terms of analyzing the context. Uh, we are on the same page. And that's exactly the way we, we analyze the current context, the way policy paradigm is going, and uh, the way our, uh, our pl planet is threatened and how poor people are, are suffering. Uh, as ActionAid, we work on human rights-based approach. And uh, after working for several years, we synthesized our approach. And we look at three important pillars uh, to, to implement human rights-based approach. You know, one is empowerment. Second is solidarity, and third is campaigning. And if we, if we not, if you're not really working on these three pillars, and if you're not really connecting, it's not that empowerment comes first. Uh, all are very inter, uh, interlinked, and and uh, uh, when we implement the strategy, and if we just focus on one, we are we are bound to fail. And I think that's what we learned from from Copenhagen experience that we were talking about. We were much more into campaigning. We did mobilize people. We did have solidarity at different level. But that grassroots mobilization was missing. The empowerment of people who are really suffering from climate change was actually missing. There was, there was hardly any voice that was coming from the grassroots. So it was not a movement in all countries. It was movement only in and around UNFCCC and around these conferences. And that's the lesson we learned. I'm happy I saw a word about alternatives. In our new strategy, starting this year, a five-year strategy, we've emphasized a lot on alternatives, which means building models. And I also see a quote there on, on models, building up new models. And that's what is actually required. If you're talking about empowerment, we can't just keep criticizing what's there on the table. Uh, we also have to come up with, uh, with new solutions, what's going to work. We have to experiment. Uh, doesn't matter if, even if we fail. But we have to come up with new solutions. We have to look at how new policies are being formulated, why it's not working. And when we analyze and implement human rights-based approach, we, we look at the role of power. You know, who has got the most power? How do we, you know, the power over and power to change and power with and power within? And when we talk about empowerment, I think that's what we need to work on. We need to look at whether communities are able to analyze what's happening around. What role do they have to play? Do they have necessary skills and knowledge to understand all that? Are they really coming together? Are we working on agency of, of poor people? Are we bringing them together? So the whole work on power with, power within, when it, when it comes to knowledge and skills, and also power with, are we really connecting with other people? That's where solidarity come in. You know, the, the number of networks that we really need to work with on, on these common issues. And then we move towards campaigning. If we are only working on campaigning and not really emphasizing enough on empowering the, the communities who are directly impacted, I don't think we are, we are going to win, win this battle or win this war. So for us, the important thing is how are we going to engage with these poor people? Are we really helping them analyze? Are we, are we making sure that they are involved in the decision-making process and, and are coming together and, and are able to increase their skills? And when we talk about our work on, on, on food and climate, that's exactly what we are doing. We are building up a model uh, called Climate Resilient Sustainable Agriculture, uh, learning, learning from agroecological practices. And that's where we are, we are increasing our own knowledge, we are, we are working with the local communities and un understanding the innovations that they have, they have done so far and how those innovations can be actually scaled up. And looking at how they can learn from each other, the example of farmer to farmer exchange, uh, looking at what kind of practices are working, uh, even when we are talking about seeds, what kind of seeds are working in different contexts and not really depending on totally market forces and seeing how technology is driving and taking away the important uh, uh, financial resources. Uh, how investment can be increased uh, in, the, in the agriculture sector. What kind of models, uh, as you said, we are focusing on smallholder, smallholder farming. And we all know that uh, uh, instead of harming the climate, Smallholder farmers, and particularly women, have a role in, in so-called cooling the planet, the kind of models, uh, agroecological models that, that they adopt. Uh, and when we look at the current context, it's actually, a, you know, from rights to food perspective, it's a broken food system. Now we look at production system, we look at distribution system, we look at the entire, entire marketing and the, and the whole speculation system right until the top. So how, how we can change that and how we can bring that from, uh, you know, from, uh, from a bottom-up Solutions. It's not that we, we don't need to focus on at the, at the international level. We do need to. 
but the whole policy work has to be informed by what people are facing, what solutions people already have, and how we can, how we can uh, scale those uh, uh, models and alternatives. And that's exactly what we are working on, you know, helping, helping communities set up and scaling up these models, doing the networking and alliance building at different levels, and then working towards campaign and, and influencing the institutions at the uh, regional and international level. And also, again, going back and, and uh, demystifying and taking the message back to local communities, how these decisions who are being taken at these uh, regional, international, or even national forums are going to impact them and how it is important for them to engage. So I think the important message and uh, mission for us is how do we channelize our energy in, in uh, strengthening the capacity of local people, involving them, setting up solutions there, and then bringing, bringing that up, and not only working at the, at the international level. Yes. So thank you very much. I think two, <clears throat> two great inputs, more from the food perspective, from the right to food perspective. And um, coming very much to the center also of climate change then, how to make a change there that we have to connect with those most vulnerable people in the world and the strategies for them. And, um, uh, and now, coming from the other side, from the climate perspective, um, I guess, Daniel, um, uh, coming also from the perspective of Greenpeace, um, and um, first to say some words to you as a person. Um, uh, we know each other quite a long time. You were one of the key actors in the German NGO um, uh, scene, climate scene, and once we brought the um, Hermes system in Germany together to court here, and we at least um, partly won this case. Um, uh, it was about um, the transparency regarding new coal power plants supporting in the world. Um, um, you had different jobs in different functions. I will not go through them, but now you are a director, um, at, uh, political director of Greenpeace International. And, um, and, uh, and I think for Greenpeace, the last years were also a very e interesting experience where you had a lot of success in mobilizing, but where we didn't come through with the results we wanted to reach. And, um, and if we stick to this picture of the stones, it would be very interesting if you would tell us a little bit what kinds of stone have you placed in the river? What what stones were successful and where really where you think they can carry us to move in the right direction? Which stones didn't prove to be such, um, so successful and where are you reconsidering your strategy? Thanks, Christoph. Um, <clears throat> I had completely forgotten about taking the export credit agency to court uh, um, until you re-mentioned it. But yes, there's many strategies we have to uh, use and that's one of them. Um, so let me also extend greetings from uh, my boss, uh, uh, Kumi Naidu, um, who would have liked to be there uh, with all of you, who would not have improved the gender balance of uh, the panel as it is uh, in this room, but who could have uh, um, made many of the points I will be making much more eloquently and uh, uh, charismatically. But he does uh, send his greetings and uh, um, will be engaged in, in the transformation discussion as we uh, go for forward. He's not here because uh, we agreed the biggest transformation of our own structure um, in uh, many, many years uh, yesterday. So he's still um, dealing with that. Coming back to your question, what were the stones and uh, um, what, what are new strategies that we're trying to uh, develop? I will be very much sharing um, work in progress here. And uh, um, in fact, one of the reasons why I was very happy that Kumi asked me to uh, stand in for him because, uh, is because I saw it as an amazing opportunity to pick all these great brains from around the world, because I'm sure we're at least uh, um, some of you are struggling with the same strategic questions uh, um, as we are. And the way we work and the way we try to change the world might be specific. But uh, um, I think the, the context challenges we face and the uh, need for much more transformational change uh, than what we've been able to deliver in our own 40-year um, history in the case of Greenpeace, but as a movement um, globally, I think is an, a dilemma and uh, um, urgency that unites us. So 
I, I'll actually, uh, even though it's true that my own background is more on the energy and climate uh, side, I uh, um, will try and give two examples, and one of them being also being from the food and agriculture side. So in the past, um, the way we've worked on transforming food and uh, climate has, and I'm simplifying greatly, obviously, uh, been very much about fighting genetic engineering in the terms of uh, um, agriculture and um, pushing forward what we call the energy revolution um, globally. We've always considered those quite transformational. Um, we didn't choose genetic engineering because it was a small field or something. We chose it because we saw it as a crucial battleground um, about the uh, corporate control of uh, um, agriculture that Tillman, among others, mentioned in her, um, his uh, introductory um, remarks. Um, and the energy revolution, I think, will be uh, regarded by um, most people, certainly everyone who works in the energy uh, um, sector, as transformational, as it does say we can deliver um, access to energy for all. We can deliver the climate uh, um, cuts, uh, emission cuts that we uh, um, require by 2050, uh, um, and we can do all of that with existing technologies. We do not need uh, um, breakthroughs. We'll probably have them, but the scenario deliberately um, doesn't assume that we will have them, but says we can do it with current technology, with what we have on the table, and without nuclear power and carbon uh, um, capture and storage. Most people, especially in energy companies, will think that's pretty transformational. What we have discovered, though, is that in many ways it's not, because it's based on IEA, um, International Energy Agency, projections. We're accepting a lot of the um, modeling and, uh, um, and economics of uh, the mainstream, quite deliberately, because we want this uh, um, piece of modeling to be taken seriously. We want it to play in that uh, um, space of energy policy where we are at now, and we want it to have a transformative impact on that energy policy. But the reality is we ourselves realize we are not with this model questioning a lot of the underlying causes of uh, um, the destruction. Similarly with GE, it's not that we uh, uh, will um, in any way decrease our opposition uh, um, to GE, but we are aware that even if we win that battle, we have not um, won the war. And I know some people are uncomfortable about these kind of uh, um, military an analogies. Uh, um, uh, we have quite deliberately uh, uh, decided that we uh, must actually use that kind of language because if um, you excuse me making that reference, uh, um, Jennifer, it is warlike impacts that uh, um, these failings of our economic systems are having. And uh, these are battles, these are wars, and we can't afford to just win battles. We must win the war. So we're in the process of uh, searching for how to move from the battles to winning um, the war. And uh, um, we are working, for example, uh, um, on a shared vision between our agriculture, forest, and energy uh, um, and climate uh, um, campaign, because we know we can't address these things uh, um, in separation. Uh, we know, and we've, uh, I should just have mentioned that about the energy revolution, unlike many other 100% renewable <laughs> scenarios, uh, it doesn't include a, um, a lot of uh, uh, biofuels or bioenergy. Um, but uh, so we've always been aware of the interlinkages, but we've so far mainly um, managed to not contradict ourselves, and we're now looking for a way of uh, actually, as you say, um, develop alternatives, develop a common vision, um, and develop uh, a common way forward. Similarly, on the energy uh, um, and, and climate side, we're looking for um, entry points where we can change the operating environment of um, the way energy policy is done. So we're looking at nuclear liability uh, um, regimes, for example. It's very obvious that if anyone had to insure a nuclear power plant, they wouldn't uh, be able to build um, one, and they would stop the ones that they are currently uh, um, running. And we're looking at other um, avenues in which we can link up fights uh, that uh, um, are disparate but need to be united in order to succeed. And so. To conclude, the one additional stone I would like to put into the river in, in this panel is the concept of rights. I think that's one where we can uh, um, start with and uh, um, agree on, um, but that we have to do a lot of work on um, putting uh, meat on those particular bones. We're starting to do that, for example, in, in India, where we are um, out of necessity in a way, because we know that uh, um, if we want to stop 
coal mining in uh, um, India if we want to ha uh, stop easy availability of local uh, um, uh, energy for uh, um, coal that will destroy not only our planet but uh, um, the uh, communities. Uh, we will have to work with the communities in the forests that are being uh, um, cleared off the land um, to allow for this uh, um, coal mining and unless we manage to uh, um, make that link and make that effective uh, um, we will not be able to succeed on our global climate goals or on the um, national energy uh, um, goals. So we are searching for uh, um, ways forward. Uh, um, there are places like Biha that are providing um, the beginnings of uh, um, stories of hope where we can manage to um, bring together energy access and renewables uh, um, development at a scale that gives us hope that we can actually do um, the transformation fast and effective uh, um, enough, but it is very much still work in progress and I'm looking forward to the next couple of days of exploring mm -hmm. those together. Yes, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Geneva, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Um, Geneva, uh, if you, um, listening to those voices from different sides, I think there is a lot of overlap where, um, the, fr concerning the urgency, concerning the different levels where we have to connect our activities, the empowerment, the solidarity, the campaigning, um, the networking, starting with the, with the empowering, um, Namadou has called it the sovereignty, food sovereignty issue, which is very closely linked there again. Um, and where for the campaigning and for the empowerment, the rights campaigning and the rights issue, food, right to food, right to water, access to energy might be one of the cornerstones um, to move forward, as Dan Daniel has pointed out. Um, what would you think about this? Is this a direction where we could get new strength as a movement? I believe so, yes. I, I actually think the food security or the food access issue you is one that could unite us um, quite strongly and makes it climate change real and the challenges that people are facing on the ground real. And I think, to be honest, in the climate movement, we've really struggled because I, I agree, we didn't have people on ground as much who were suffering. We didn't have them engaged and their voices engaged, which I think has allowed politicians and corporations to make this seem like a faraway issue that isn't impacting anybody yet and and we now we know that's not the case and so i i think the issue of food and energy um, access or energy services and justice um are ones i would i would put in a, a justice or a human rights-based approach as well we're we're starting to think about that a bit at wri actually and uh, um, but um, uh, yes, is my answer to your question. I, I think it could be very powerful elements uh, or drivers, really, of a, of a movement that could link the on the ground, but really bring it into an international context that's political and um, is much more real. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, and um, now we have lots of people in the room who are not only here to listen, but also to raise their own voice. And um, now we want to ask all of you for five minutes to come together, four people always, sitting around next to you, and to prepare one question to the audience. It, uh, only five minutes time will be harsh. If you don't have an answer, a question until then, you will not be able to put it on the, uh, for the plenary. Time is running. We start immediately now, and in five minutes, you are able to present then those questions. Um, we will take those questions, and the panel has to answer, trying to answer, and to relate to them. Not so, panel. I think for each other. yes, but I think for the for the debate, I think it's it's better really that the panel tries then to react uh, to to those. Um, so um, now, please just join with your neighbors. Um, three, four, five people 
um, and think about this question.